All right, we're witnessing the biggest shake-up of work, workplace relations in a generation. But will it do what the government claims it will do, lift workers' pay and conditions, or is this, as the opposition claims, an ideologically driven solution looking for a problem? The Fair Pay Agreements Bill will force employers to negotiate pay and conditions with unions, and it'll only take 10% of a workforce to trigger the discussions, although there are other triggers as well. The bill passed its first reading in Parliament last night. National MP Todd McClay argued... This is more about kickbacks for unions who donated money to Labour at the last election. Take a look. If you have to put fair in the name of a piece of legislation when it comes to pay agreement, it is not fair to anybody other than making it easier for your union mates. That's it. So the unions find it hard to go around the country and to get New Zealanders to sign up and pay them a fee. And if they don't get those fees, it's very hard for them to provide money by way of campaign funding to the Labour Party. Right, we start with one of those union mates this morning, President of the CTU, the Council of Trade Unions, Richard Wagstaff. Good morning. Morena. And Leanne Watson is here as well from the Canterbury Chamber of Commerce. Good morning to you. Kia ora, Ryan. So I want to start with this idea that, that's been pushed by the opposition, um, Richard. Do unions stand to benefit financially from this change? Uh, I don't believe so. The design of this is all about lifting wages for, for people who are stuck in a low-wage spiral. And um, uh, those sorts of accusations that I've been hearing, the Council of Trade Unions has never and will never give money to any political parties. Uh, but this is about trying to enable working people to set a basic floor so that they can right. still carry on and negotiate their own agreements. So union, unions won't benefit financially from this at all? Well, I don't believe so. What, what they'll be doing is they will be uh, representing all workers, but they'll, they'll only be collecting um, fees from their members. So all workers will benefit from this. They'll be representing all of them, talking to all of them about the, the, the negotiations they're about to go into, but there'll be no compulsion whatsoever for those members to pay any money to the union. OK, and they won't get any, any government money for doing uh, the negotiations? There is, money, there is money offered for the bargaining side, uh, uh, to help them go out there and talk to, to members, but that's uh, fifty thousand dollars for a whole bargaining side, uh, which is which isn't really a, a lot of money when you consider the enormous amount of work they'll have to do. I, well, it'd be a lot of money to the low-paid workers, I would think. But anyway, um, well, you said that the Council of Trade Unions doesn't pay donations to the Labor Party, but your affiliates do, don't they? The Dairy Workers Union, the Maritime uh, Union, the Rail Etu. That's ninety, forty, forty, twenty thousand dollars each at the last election. Yeah, that's a small number of unions. The vast majority of unions uh, don't pay any money to the Labor Party or any political party. OK. Just as, just as employers pay money to the, to the National Party, but, but I'm sure uh, the vast majority don't. OK. Leanne, let's bring you in now, because I want to hear from employers about what your thoughts are on the bill at first reading last night. Yeah, certainly we are opposed to the fair pay agreements. We believe that this bill will take employment legislation back to the 1970s. It strips away the rights of both employers and employees to negotiate pay conditions for those circumstances that suit both employees and employers. So we are totally opposed to this. We believe that it is a campaign to increase union membership. It does nothing to lift productivity and innovation and to drive our economy forward, which is what the government should be focusing on. Richard, can you give us a tangible example for those workers at home right now who might be low paid, might be in some of these industries, like hospitality, for example. What is one tangible thing that they will get out of this? Will they get a longer lunch break? How much will their wages increase by? Well, I just want to correct something that was just said too. Every single employee, uh, either individually or collectively, will still need to negotiate their own conditions of employment. This is simply putting in a minimum floor under which they can't, they can't fall. So what will happen is that instead of uh, workers being pitted against each other for lower and lower rates, they will basically say, in this industry, in this, for this kind of worker, be it a bus driver or a security guard, you can't negotiate less than this floor. A bit like the minimum wage, but actually more uh, designed for a whole industry. And so we would expect that when uh, companies, like we saw this in, in the Wellington bus industry, when they compete against each other to win a tender, they won't do it on the cost of labour. They'll do it on quality and innovation and productivity. And we saw that quite explicitly in Wellington, where bus drivers 
the employer locked them out to force them onto lower wages so that that company could compete with other companies okay. that had low so wage strategies. So it won't change anything? Like, if I wanted to take my lunch break in the half hour before I left work, for example, as opposed to halfway through my shift, that won't, nothing like that will be affected. I can create my own individual um, contract. You have to create your own employment agreement. This is just a flaw. If the national standard says you can't take a lunch break for that reason, then, then maybe you could, but the point is... Right, so this, is, so, so this is the thing, you've been a bit disingenuous, aren't you, when you say that nothing changes, you can still make a direct uh, negotiation with your employer, but the minimum standards that are set, which, by the way, we don't even know what they will be yet, might impact that agreement you have in place. Absolutely, well, it takes away that Sorry, flexibility. You just... Leanne, I'll bring you in, Leanne, because I think we might have, uh, Richard might have missed some of that. Leanne? I'm back now. All right, we'll go to Richard. Richard. Yeah, so what I was saying is that... It... So... <laughs> Richard, you've got the floor. Uh, what, I, what I just wanted to say was, look, the industry standard will be set by employers and unions in that industry, so it makes sense for that industry. They're not going to create conditions that don't make sense for that industry. But, yes, it does make a difference. There'd be no point in doing this if it made no difference. And the difference it's going to make is to provide a proper floor so that workers themselves can't be put on lower conditions than other workers uh, to drag the industry down. And uh, we've seen that in New Zealand. We're stuck in a low-wage spiral. Uh, other countries that are more profitable, innovative, uh, productive than New Zealand have systems like this, and that's what we need to do to catch up with those countries. Leanne, what are businesses telling you about, because obviously this is going to increase costs for them, what are they going to do with those costs? So this is not about uh, focusing on an increased cost for business. This is about making sure that we lift the productivity of New Zealand businesses to help them basically drive the economy, which enables us to lift the wages across New Zealand businesses. You know, I talk to businesses every day, and many of those businesses are already paying above the minimum wage, above the minimum entitlement, and they care very deeply about the well-being of their employees. So why would this... So businesses Leanne, are opposed to this. Sorry, well, why would they care about this then? If they're already doing the right thing and paying above and beyond, this won't affect them. Well, it does take um, that flexibility for them to actually negotiate with their employees directly away. And, you know, one of the other things that is really important to acknowledge here is that there is no differentiation between a small business who, say, employs 10 staff uh, having to match the same uh, pay and conditions as a large business employing 500 staff. So that's really challenging. Given New Zealand is made up of small businesses, this will have a significant impact across uh, New Zealand's small business community. Richard, can you just tell, for, uh, tell us this morning, tell our audience this morning, what is stopping people joining a union right now and using industrial action and strikes and whatnot to force an employer to and set minimum standards. You know, you've already got unions. You've got the people are free to join a union if they want to. They're free to bargain collectively if they want to. What's stopping low-paid employees that you're talking about from doing all of these things that you want them to do now? I just think the reality for a lot of workers is uh, there is no union in their workplace. And for them to say on their first day at work in their 90-day trial, I want to form a union here, is uh, seen to be uh, not well received by their employer and they fear for their employment. You just think about that worker who gets a job in a corner dairy or, or, or in a workplace where there is no union. It's just not a realistic strategy could it be, to say to their Could employer, it be that, that people are quite here. happy, Richard? People are quite happy to be negotiating well, individually I, 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 with their employers and they don't actually like unions? No, that, that I don't, we don't believe that's the case. We know from surveys that unions are, are, are welcomed by a lot of workers, but they're too frightened to join. I'll give you an example. We did the pay equity settlement for 55,000 workers, only which, only of which about 10 or 15% were union members. There wasn't a single person in that 55,000 people who said to us, we didn't want this deal and we wish you hadn't done it. They all said this is fantastic and that they did it very much like this. We represented people who aren't in unions and they're very happy for that minimum standard okay. that we achieved there. I think the point you made before to Leanne about good employers don't have nothing to fear. In fact, good employers have a lot to gain because they won't be undercut by poor employers who mm. undercut their conditions with low right. wages and poverty. Richard, we have to leave it there. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Really appreciate it. That's Thank the you. president of the CTU, Richard Wagstaff, and Leanne Watson as well from the Christchurch Chamber of Commerce.